Welcome back to the Prep Pros YouTube channel. My name is Matt. In today's video, I'm going to take you through an entire ACT math test. Now, if you don't already know me, I've been a professional tutor for the last 10 years. I've gotten a perfect score in the ACT multiple times, have coached nine students to perfect scores, many more to 34s and 35s on uh, the ACT math test, and I've actually even published my own ACT math book. So I'm super serious about this stuff, big test prep nerd, and I'm really here to help you guys I help guide you guys to a much better test score. Now, before you start this video, I would highly recommend that you download this practice test, which you can get for free on our website. All you gotta do is go to the homepage. You can sign up for the free trial and ultimate ACT course, no credit card required, and then you can get a download of this. I would definitely say take a shot at this test before watching the rest of the video, where I will take you through and show you how to answer all 60 of these questions correctly. Along the way, I'm gonna drop lots of really important strategies, tips, tricks, and equations on many topics you need to know for test day on the ACT. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we'll start here with number one. Now remember, as you go through your math test, the, in, uh, the difficulty increases. So the first 15, 20 questions will be a little easier, then a little more medium. The last 10 or 15 will feel a lot harder. You'll notice that increases as we go through this practice test here as well. So number one is just a basic exponents question. When we multiply exponents, we multiply the numbers together, so we get 12. When we multiply exponents together, we add. So x to the fourth, it's like x to the first. So we add those together, x to the fifth y to the fifth, y to the fourth, we add the exponents, we get y to the ninth, so the correct answer here is e. Number two is a probability question. Table below gives the exact probability of randomly selecting a straw of a certain color from a box of straws. We're asked the probability of not picking red, not picking yellow. So not red and not yellow, we wanna count the rest of the probabilities here. If we add those together, 0.3 plus 0.15 plus 0.1, we get 0 0.55, and we get our answer here of g. Number three, the mean of four numbers is nine. If three of the numbers are two, three, and 11, what's the fourth number? Well, to find the average, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add up all of the numbers. We can call our fourth number x divided by four gives me a value of nine because we know that the sum divided by the number of numbers, which is four, is going to give us an average of nine. So to solve for x, we multiply both sides by four, so I get I'll combine these, uh, two plus three is five, plus 11 is going to be 16. So 16 plus X equals nine times four is 36. To solve for X, we subtract 16 from both sides and get X equals 20. Answer is E. All right, let's keep on going. Number four, during a sporting event, Larry's Sandwich Spot tracked the number of sandwiches sold uh, to each customer, a total of 1,500 transactions were made. The results are shown below how many customers purchased exactly two sandwiches, okay? So here, we see 41% of customers purchased two sandwiches. So if there are 1,500 different transactions or customers, we can do 1,500 and find 41%, which is the same as times 0 0.41. So of course here, I'll go to my calculator. It's always good to use your calculator. Make it easy. Um, you're allowed to use, I have a fancy graphing calculator. You're allowed to use these. Any scientific calculator as well is also totally fine. So here, if we do that, we get a value of 615 and an answer of J. Number five, what is the value of X in the equation? Five thirds uh, equals X minus one fourth. So here, uh, what we can do is there's actually a good way to cheat using your calculator. If you want to, um, we can actually, we know that here X is equal to five thirds plus one fourth equals X. So I can go actually to my calculator and I can just type in five thirds. So just make sure you do parentheses like five over three and then plus parentheses one over four. So if we do that, I'll do five over three plus one over four. And then you're gonna get this weird number. You get this number 1.91666, blah, 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 it keeps going. Now, what you can do is there's a button on your calculator that lets you switch from fractions to decimals, which is really helpful with decimals to fraction. If you have a regular calculator, you'll see this little F to D button on your calculator. If you have a T84 like I have, what you can do is you can press math and then once you press math, you're gonna see a button that says frac. If I do that, hit math and then hit frac, my calculator will tell me that the answer is going to be 23 over 12, which I can recognize here is going to be one and 11 twelfths. So the answer here is going to be E. We could also do this algebraically. I'll do it algebraically over here. To do algebraically, we have to make the denominators the same. So here, if I have three and four to add these, we have to make them both divisible by 12. So if I have five thirds, I have to multiply this one by four on top and on bottom. If I have 
1 fourth, I'd multiply this one by 3 on top and on bottom. So if we do the math here, I get 20 over 12 plus 3 over 12 equals 23 over 12. Uh, 12 over 12 is 1, and then we have 11 extra, so that's what we get to eat. So on to number 6 here, looking for the least common denominator. Any least common denominator question, the easiest way to do it is use the answer choices. We're just looking for the first number, 8, 20, and 3, all divide into evenly. Uh, 20 does not divide into 24, so that one's out. 8 does not divide into 60. 3 does not divide into 80. The first number that all of them divide into is J. You can just do 120 divided by 8, divided by 20, and divided by 3. They all give us whole numbers. All right, number seven, funky looking functions question. They like these sometimes. We have this weird f x y equals 2x minus 3y squared. All we need to do is treat it like a regular functions question. So for f1, 2, we're going to plug in the 1 where the x is, the negative 2 where the y is. So it's just going to be 2 times 1 minus 3 times negative 2. We'll make it brackets instead. This whole thing is going to be squared. So 2 times 1 is 2 minus 3 times negative 2, negative 3 times negative 2 is going to be plus 6. And then we are squaring this whole thing. 2 plus 6 gives me 8 squared, which is 64. So the answer here is E. All right, number 8, Antonia has paid $16 per hour for the first 40 hours of her work week with regular pay. For each hour she works over 40 hours, she earns one half times the regular rate. How much does she earn in a week when she works 60 hours? Well, we'll start with her first 40 hours. We know for 40 hours, she earns $16 an hour, and then she works a total of 60 hours. So she works 20 hours beyond the regular 40, and she gets 1.5 times her pay. Well, we can do a regular pay of 16 times 1.5, it's a dollar sign, to give us, and we can of course, again, use your calculator, make it easy. So we can go, boom, $24 per hour. So that's how we find her total. So we can do 40 times 16, plus 20 times 24, which gives a total value of 1,120. So our answer here is going to be G. All right, number nine is a matrices question. Now, matrices is a topic that a ton of students have never learned before in school, or you might look at this. If you look at this, you're like, what are these? Totally fine. They're on the ACT. They're actually not too hard. But again, they're a topic a lot of people have not learned, or many other of you, or others of you might have seen before, but totally forgotten how to do. Now, if you need to learn or relearn matrices, uh, in that same free trial and ultimate ACT course I mentioned, there is the entire, uh, basically, videos of me teaching you everything you need to know about matrices. Matrix multiplication, matrix dimensions, matrix addition, subtraction, and everything else as well. So it's all in there. It's entirely free. It also has the entire chapter of matrices from my math book, along with a bunch of practice questions. So a great place you can go to learn exactly how to do questions like this. Now, matrix addition subtraction is actually really easy. So all we need to do here is A plus 3B. Now to do this, all we need to do is stay in the same spot. So it's just simple addition. So A, we'll start with the top left, just stay in the same spot, plus 3B. So if we're doing A plus 3B, it's just A, which is negative 4, plus 3B, which is times 2. So the top left spot of our matrix is just, do that math, negative 4 plus 6, which is going to be positive 2. So at this point, let's check the answer choices already. Don't, for matrices, never do all four of them. So we can already go, all right, all those are wrong. It's got to be D or E. So let's say we do top right, A plus 3B. Well, it's going to be A, which is 3 plus 3. Sorry, let me get that plus sign of the middle there. Uh, it's A is our 3 plus 3B, which is 5. 3 plus 3 times 5 is 15. So add 3, we get a value of 18 in the top right. We can already tell the answer is E. So again, a really, really easy topic that you can get um, a lot better at, but a lot of students get stumped in these in the ACT. So again, check that free trial, check out the videos, you know exactly how to do questions like this and harder ones you can see later in the test as well. <coughs> okay, excuse me. Number 10, we have a midpoint question. A, B is located at the point C, 3, 10 in the X, Y plane. Given that A is at negative 4, 2, what is B? So we have to use our midpoint equation here. Also good to draw this out. So our midpoint equation is X1, plus x2 over 2, and then y1 plus y2 over 2. And always on these questions, I have to say, give yourself a little visual. So I'm not going to draw it all out, but let's say point C is at 310. So let's say it's over 3, and let's say up here is 10. So this is my point 310. Point A is at negative 3, 4. So if this is my point negative 3, 4. So this is point A. This is point C which means that point B has to be somewhere up here. So 
get this out of the way so we'll redraw it so we can see it better. So point C again is at the point 310. Okay, so there's two ways to solve this algebraically or using our graph. I'll start with the graph. So with the midpoint, however far up and over we go, we have to go the same amount up and over. So here to go from negative 3, 4 to 4, 10, we go up 6 units and over 6 units because we're going from 4 to 10 is up 6, negative 3 to positive 3 is over 6. So we have to again go up 6 and over 6. If we go up 6 units, it's going to be 16 over 6 units is going to be 9. So our answer is H. Other way to solve this is I know one X coordinate, negative 3 plus my other X coordinate over 2 has to equal the midpoint. So one endpoint plus the other over 2. So if we solve this out, I get negative 3 plus X equals 6 because I would multiply both sides by 2. Now I add to both sides, I get X equals 9. Once I get X equals 9, we could eliminate a bunch of answers. We could repeat the same thing for Y. So it would be my first Y is 0.4 plus my second Y, I don't know, over 2 would equal 10. Again, we can solve this out. It'll be 4 plus Y equals 20, which gives me Y equals 16. So either way works, whatever one you're comfortable with works for midpoint questions. All right, number 11, we have some unit conversion. They love this on recent ACTs. So we're given this note, we're gonna have to use this as we solve any unit conversion questions. So we're told a tennis complex uh, is 450 feet by 288, and we're trying to find the area of this. Now, we are told, again, I'll draw this out. So we're told it's 450 feet by 288 feet, and we have a conversion for acreage. Now let's first find the area of this, and area is just length times width. So we're gonna do 450 times 288 to find our area, which is 129,600. Now, to convert my area, and this is feet squared, which is the same as square feet, I have to do some unit conversions. So 129,600 square feet. If you've ever done any chemistry or physics, you've probably done this little cross down method. We wanna put our square feet on the bottom. So, oops, sorry, feet squared, and our one acre on top. Anytime you're converting units, you always wanna make sure the units cancel. So now all we do is multiply the numbers out. So we do 129,600. We're gonna divide that by 43,560, and we get a value of 2.97, which of course is our answer of three. Whenever a question says is closest to or approximately, it's asking you to do some rounding. All right, number 12, uh, we're trying to find the solution to the system of equations. So here, a couple ways to do this. I like to use elimination. So we have our equations 3x minus y equals 10 and x plus 2y equals 1. I can solve for x or y here. We'll go ahead and multiply the top one by 2. So it becomes 6x minus 2y equals 20. The reason I did that is, we can ignore this top one now, when I add these together, my y's cancel. I get 7x equals 21. We can divide by 7, and I get x equals 3. So I know the x coordinate is 3, which already shows me my answer here is going to be f. All right, number 13. We just need to combine like terms. So these are a little bit out of order. Erase this stuff to make it clearer to see. So we want to combine like terms. So let's start with our a cubed b terms. We see them here and here. So it's 11, and then it's minus negative 5. Make sure we distribute that. So 11 minus negative 5 is plus 5, so it's 16 a cubed b. Let's do our a b squared terms. It's 7 minus 9, because it's minus plus, we do a minus. So 7 minus 9 is going to be negative 2 a b squared. And then we have negative 6a and 4a. Negative 6a minus 4a is going to be negative 10a. So we've done that correctly. Always be careful with negative signs on test. I'd love to trick you that stuff. So. All we got to do here is pick which one is correct, and we can see the only one that matches. Exactly what we wrote is going to be B. All right, number 14 is a circle equation. So all we need to do is know how the circle graph works. So here we have x squared plus y squared equals 64. Now x squared plus y squared is a circle with a center at the origin and a radius of 8 because our circle equations are x squared plus y squared equals r squared when a circle is at the origin. So if we kind of think about drawing this out, what the circle would look like, there we go. So it's gonna go basically eight units left, right, up, and down. So it's gonna to go to the point 
eight zero, zero eight, negative eight zero, and zero negative eight. So all we need to do is pick the one that has two points from that. So those are going to be our y intercepts. All right, fifteen. Uh, we need to factor this uh, equation. So here we can do this in a variety of ways. Some of you might have learned like a box method where we set it up like this. Some of you might do an X method. Some of you might just do some guess and check. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of do, I'll do the box method. Why not? So we know X squared minus 40. Now I have X's on the outside. I need two numbers that multiply to 40 and add to multiply to negative 40 and add to positive six. So here I can do plus 10 and negative four because I get 10x and negative 4x. So my factors are x plus 10 and x minus 4. So c is the factor that matches there. All right, 16. Q is a real number such that 64 is less than Q squared is less than 881, which the following is a possible value of Q. Two ways to do this. One way, back solve. Just take the answer choices and plug them in and play guess and check. If you do that and play guess and check, G is the only one going to work. Other way to solve this is recognize the pattern here. 64 is the same as 8 squared. It's less than Q squared. 81 is the same as 9 squared. So to be between 8 squared and 9 squared, Q needs to be somewhere between 8 and 9. And of course, 8.7 is our only value between 8 and 9. All right, 17, we have absolute value stuff here. Remember, the absolute value turns whatever's in the absolute value bars positive. So an absolute value of negative six becomes six minus one half. We need to simplify the terms inside first. 10 minus 18 is gonna be negative eight. The absolute value of negative eight turns into positive eight. So we get six minus one half times eight is four. Six minus four gives me a value of positive two. So my answer here is going to be C. All right, 18, another average question. Uh, average score of seven students who took a biology test is 81. Mateo had the highest score. If Mateo's score is removed from the group, the average score of the other six students is 79. What was Mateo's score on the biology test? Now, this is an example of another type of question that students often get stumped by. So if you find this tricky, uh, there's also a free trials in my ultimate ACT math course, which is basically a over 30 hours, it's actually close to 35 now, uh, videos of me going through and teaching you my entire ACT math book. So it has tons of videos of me teaching you all the concepts. It also has videos of me showing you how to um, answer every single question in the entire math book. So tons and tons of practice. Again, you guys can get access to that entire chapter for free. There's a link down below uh, showing you exactly where you can sign up for all of those free trials. Now, with this one, we have to learn how to work backwards. So remember, our average is equal to the sum divided by the number of things. And I know that seems, you're probably like averages are easy map. We look at this question, it seems kind of tricky. So we have to often work backwards. Now, we know seven students got an 81. So I know the average of is 81 for seven students. So some number, I'll call it x over seven is 81. We can multiply both sides by seven. I'll use my calculator, seven times 81. It's 567. So I know that 567 equals x. And what this represents is this is the sum of all seven students. Okay, so we know what everyone's score added up is. We don't actually know their scores, but in order to have an average of 81, it has to be 567. Now, once I take Mateo's score away, I know the other six students average is 79. So I can repeat that. So I know their average is 79, some number, I'll call it y divided by six is 79. So I can do the same thing. I can multiply both sides by six. Six times 79 gives me 474 equals y. And this y represents the sum of the six students. So this was all the students together, 567. 474 was the six students left over after we took my Mateo's score. So to find Mateo's score, we do 567 minus 474. So again, huge calculator, make it easy. And we find a, that he got a score of 93, the answer is H. So again, not hard in terms of math, but tricky in terms of knowing how to set it up. Very uh, classic kind of thing for the AST at times. You'll see math that feels easy, but you're just like, I don't really know what to do with it. All right, 18, uh, we are asked to find the perimeter of our kite. We have right triangles here. So to find the perimeter, we need to find the outside angles. So we'll start with uh, this one here. We can use our Pythagorean theorem. 
So to find x, we know that uh, x squared equals 18 squared plus 4 squared. So it's like a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So 18 squared is going to be 324. 4 squared is 16. So we know that x squared equals 340, which means x equals the square root of 340, which again, just use my calculator to make it easy. I get a value that's around 18.44. Okay. So I know that my top is 18.44, my bottom is 18.44. Now, what about our other side length here? Well, this is four, this is four. What's my hypotenuse here? We can do our same deal. A squared plus B squared equals, I'll call this X again, X squared. So four squared plus four squared is 32 equals X squared. So the square root of 32 equals my new value of X. So the square root of 32 is going to be 5.66. So we know our values here are going to be 5.66 and 5.66. If we add these up, 18.44 times 2 plus 5.66 times 2, I get a value of 48.2, of course, which is closest to approximately 48. The answer here is E. All right, 20, we have our tricky exponents rules. So the important thing to note here is how to deal with this. Now, we should know our fractional exponent rule. x to the a over b is equal to the bth root of x to the a. So this is an important rule to memorize and understand for test day. So with this one, I can rewrite this as x to the 45 over 3 to the 1 third. Now, x to the 45 over 3 simplifies. x to the 15th, because 45 over 3 is 15, to the 1 third. Now, when we do a power to a power, 15 to the 1 third, we multiply. So 15 times 1 third is 5. So the answer here is g. It's just x to the 5th. 21, Matt's filling his fish tank, 4.30 p.m. There's no water, and it fills the tank at a rate of 5.5 inches per hour with a hose. At 7.15, what's the depth? Well, we know it's five and a half inches per one hour. We can always write rates like this. And how much time has gone by? Well, to go from 4.30 to 7.15, 5.30, one hour, 6.30, two hours, 7.30 would be three. If we take away 15 minutes, it's two hours, 45 minutes, which we can write as 2.75 hours because 45 minutes is three quarters of an hour. So we can multiply this by 2.75 hours. The hours cancel, so we will just get our units here. So if we do five times 2.75, or sorry, five and a half, which we make 5.5 times 2.75, we get a value of 15.125. Looking at the answers, we can already tell it is D. 1 eighth is the same as 0.125. All right, 22, we got some geometry here. Each side of a square has a length of 60. So We'll sketch out a square to make it easy. So each side is 60. Right triangle EGF has a height of 40. I'm not drawing needs to scale, just for labeling up. So if the square and right triangle have equal angles, what's the length of the base? All right, sorry, not equal areas. Equal, <laughs> equal areas, not equal angles. Okay, so area of a square, remember, is just side squared. So we do 60 times 60. So our area of our square is 3,600. Now the area of our triangle, remember, is one half base times height. So I know the area has to be the same. So 3600 has to be equal to one half my base, I don't know of x, and my height is 40. So what we can do is we can simplify 3600, one half times 40 is 20. So we can do 3600 divided by 20, and we get x equals 180. So our answer here, if I finish that out, is going to be f. All right, 23, we have some vectors. So vectors do appear on the ACT as well at times. This is another example of a topic that a lot of students might not have seen before, but you do need to know this for test day. I would say it's on maybe 25, 30% of ACTs. I would say maybe like, maybe a little more than that. It depends, honestly, recently there's been a lot more vectors questions. So good topic to know. Now here, we have to know how to add vectors. Now to add vectors, there's a little tip to tail method that you can learn. So let's say this is my first vector A and my second vector B. To do this, we basically draw vector A, and then we start at the end of vector A and draw vector B. So this is basically a little tip to tail method, A plus B. 
where we end up, I actually draw it in a solid line, the resulting vector is going to be our a plus b. So that vector I drew here is going to be the sum. Now, how do we actually write this, this whole i, j thing? Well, what this is, is i is like the x component, how far left or right you go. So you can think of this as our i, and the vertical is our j. So our initial vector, the one that I labeled as a over here, we could write this, since we go over 2 and up 4, as 2i plus 6j. Our second vector over here in ij notation would be negative 3i plus 2j. And our final vector, the a plus b that we did here, goes left 1, so it's negative 1i or just negative i, and then up 8. So the answer here is going to be a. Again, that seems a little bit confusing. It's totally fine. It's going to take a little while as far as getting used to how to do these if these are brand new to you. But we can solve these by kind of doing that tip to tail method. Or if we understand this whole ij notation, if we add these, just add the x components, 2 and negative 3 gives us negative i, the 6 and the 2 gives us the 8j. All right, 24. Uh, we're trying to find the tangent of angle b. So if we're trying to find the tangent of angle B, we need to know the opposite and the adjacent. That's our good old Soka Toa. So to find the opposite, we have to do some math, Pythagorean theorem. So let's say our opposite side here, I'll call this side X. So we know that 13 squared plus X squared equals 14 squared. So we can do the math, 13 squared is 169 plus X squared equals 14 squared is 196. If we subtract that 196 minus 169, we get 27. So if I take the square root of that, I get x equals the square root of 27. We can simplify square root of 27. If we do our little factor tree, it's 9 times 3, and then 9 is 3 times 3. Remember, to simplify, we're looking for pairs to put in the front. Anything by itself stays underneath. So our side length, our opposite, has a value of 3 root 3. Now, our tangent of angle B is opposite 3 root 3 over adjacent 13. So our correct answer here is going to be G. Important to know how to do, again, a variety of steps. Know your Sokotoa stuff and also understand how we simplify these guys as well. <clears throat> All right, uh, number 25, we have logarithms here. Now, a favorite way to answer logs questions on the test is to use our little change of base rule. So our change of base rule is if we have log base A of B, I can just type in my calculator log B over log A, which means for any of you who aren't as familiar with logs or haven't done logs much before, we can actually solve, let's say, log base 4 of 16. All you need to do is type into your calculator log 16 over log 4. It'll tell you log base 4 of 16 is 2. If you type in log base 2 of 16, you can just type it in as log 16 over log 2. It would tell you that that is going to be 4. So 6 times 2 is 12, minus 4 is going to be 8, and our answer here is D. For those of you who have done logs, just as a very quick refresher, if I do log base 4 of 16, it equals 2, because 4 to the second power equals 16. Uh, similarly, log base 2 of 16 equals 4 because 2 to the 4th power equals 16. But again, for those of you guys who are new, knowing this rule is super helpful. If you have a fancy calculator like I have here, T84, you can press um, math. And then if you scroll down, you will see something that says log base. You can use that as well. It'll let you just type actually these directly in. All right, let's keep going. 26 inequalities, uh, so we just have to solve our algebra here. So let's combine like terms, add 2x to both sides, add 5 to both sides. So we get 11x is going to be less than 13. All we need to do now is divide both sides by 11. x is going to be less than 13 over 11. So here uh, we have our answer is going to be g. Remember with uh, inequalities, you only uh, flip the direction of the inequality when you're dividing by a negative sign. All right, 27 to get to the final game of the basketball tournament. The Buffalo Bulldogs must win two games. In the first game, they have a 75% chance of winning. Second game, they have a 40% chance of winning. What's the probability they reach the final? So what we need to do here is multiply these. So our first is a 0.75 chance of winning the first game. The second one, they have a 0.4 chance of winning. So all you need to do to find that, you multiply them together. So if we have multiple events, like multiple, say roll a dice twice, you have to multiply to find the outcome. 
Same deal here, we multiply our two probabilities. We get 0.3, which is the same as 30%. Answer here is B. All right, 28, we got some angle stuff. So we're told that A, B, C, this whole thing is 126. A, B, E, this part here is 67 degrees. And D, B, C, this part here is 83 degrees. We're trying to find what is this little middle piece. Okay, so we know that if we do 67 plus 83, if we add those up, the 67 degrees plus 83 degrees gives me a value of 150. Now, I'm only supposed to have 126, so we have to subtract to find out what the overlap is that we need to take away. So our answer here is going to be 24 degrees. Now, I can diagram that out more thoroughly so you guys can see exactly why. So again, let's say that this here is 24 degrees, right? So if I do my math out, if this whole part, um, this is D, B, C. If this is 83 degrees, we can do 83 minus 24, which gives me 59 degrees over here. I should make sure I did this right. I might have done this wrong in my head. Um, if the whole thing is 67 degrees, we do 67 minus 24, which is 43 degrees. 43 plus 24 plus 59 gives me a value of 126. So cool, I did it correctly. Now you could also, if you didn't really know what the shortcut was, you could also just back solve. You could guess and check what the answer choice is and just plug them in like I did here. And we can calculate those values and see, do all the angles we get, add to 126. Here, we get that it works, so our answer is H. If you tried, it wasn't H, you could always try a different value until you figured out which one it was. All right, 29 is a coding question. So we have a code, it's five characters long, three letters, two numbers. So. Whenever we're doing these questions, I like to kind of, as you see here, give myself a visual, and all you need to ask yourself is how many options are there at each spot? So it says the no code contains letters O, I, or Q, or number zero or one, and they cannot be repeated. Okay, so the first spot in the code, there are 26 letters in the alphabet, but we can't use O, I, or Q. So there's 23 options for the first spot. If let's say these are our letters, 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 and these are gonna be our numbers and numbers. Now. It says the letters cannot be repeated. So once I put one letter here, I only have 22 letters I can pick from for the next spot. Once I put a letter there, there's 21 letters left for the third spot. Now, numbers, I can't use zero or one. So there are 10 numbers I could use zero all the way up through nine, but I can't use those ones. So there's eight options for my first number. I cannot repeat the number, then there is seven. To solve for the total possibilities, we multiply these values together. So we just gotta pick the one that matches that which we see here is our correct answer of A. All right, number 30, uh, we have a Venn diagram question. So 30 students, we have 14 students play soccer, 10 play basketball, four play both. How many play? Neither. So we'll make a little Venn diagram here. I know this is something you guys might have not done for a while. So Venn diagram, this is kind of our entire area and we're gonna have our two circles kind of representing our, our parts. So let's say this is going to be soccer here and let's say this is going to be baseball all right so the trick to these questions is start with the both we know four people play both now 14 students play soccer which means 10 students are over here who play only soccer my whole circle for soccer has to be 14 four play both so 10 only play soccer now similarly for baseball 10 play baseball so that means six play only baseball so if i add these up 10 plus 4 plus 6 i've accounted for 20 students so far and there's 30 students total, so that means there have to be another 10 students out here who played neither, so the answer is going to be J. All right, 31, uh, a red foot, uh, red foot, redwood tree stands on level ground from a point that is 400 feet away uh, that is same level as the base, the angle of elevation at the top is 38 degrees. So let's say this over here, vertical is our, yay, this is our tree, very nice tree. So we know the tree is 400 feet away and the angle of elevation is 38 degrees. Okay, so now if we are going to be solving this, what we need to figure out is how, and here angle of elevation is always like the bottom one in this, uh, in this situation. So what we need to do is we basically need to set up and do some Soka Toa. So if it's 400, our angle of elevation that we're looking at the top of the tree is 38 degrees. How do we find this length over here? Well, this is going to be tangent, because if we're going from 38, we have our opposite and our adjacent. So, how do 
how we set this up. We're going to say the tangent of 38 degrees equals our x over 400. To solve for x, we multiply both sides by 400. So I get 400 times the tangent of 38 equals x. So if we do 400 tangent of 38 in your calculator, we get a value of 312, which is closest to 315. All right, uh, repeating patterns questions. So what is the 417th decimal after the repeating decimal 0 0.904326? Now, how do we do these questions? Well, we can go to the back of the pattern. So what's gonna happen is we repeat this pattern 0 0.904326, 904326, and so on. Every time we get to six, this is the sixth one after, this is the 12th one after, we're gonna hit six every multiple of six. So I need to find a multiple of six near 417. So what I do is I do 417 divided by six, I get 69.5, so I can round that up, or round that down, or round it down. So again, I did 417 divided by six, gives me 69.5, I can round this down to 69, and multiply it by six. 69 times six gives me 414. So what that tells me is that 414 is going to be a multiple of six. So it's gonna be here in the sequence or here in the sequence at the end. I need to count to 417. So 414 is right here. So 415 is gonna be a nine, then 416 is gonna be a zero, and 417 is going to be a four, so the answer is J. All right, uh, number 30, we are asked to find the area of the shaded region. So we can start with the area of the whole rectangle, which is gonna be length times width, so 25 times 12. So 25 times 12 is going to be 300. We need to subtract the area of the circle. Now the trick here is we know that the circle has the same height as the rest of the box which means the radius of the circle is six, and the area of a circle is pi r squared. Our circle has a radius of six, so our area is equal to 36 pi, which we can use our calculators to tell us is 113.09, so we can do 300 minus our 113, which gives me an area of 187. Answer is C. 34, we got a composite function question. Find f of g of two. I actually do these inside out. So start with g of two, and we're to find g of two, we plug two into the x's of our function. So g of two is gonna be two squared minus five times two plus three. Two squared is four, five times two is 10 plus three. So four minus 10 is gonna be negative six, plus three is gonna be negative three. So now, make sure that math right. Minus 10 plus 3. Yeah, good. So now what we do is we can replace the g of 2 with negative 3. So all we're doing now is finding f of negative 3. So we can plug in negative 3 for the x's here. So it's 3 times negative 3 squared minus 2 times negative 3. Order of operations. 3 times negative 3 squared is 3 times 9. Negative 2 times negative 3 is plus 6. 3 times 9 is going to be 27, plus 6 is 33, answer is H. All right, 35, we have to know our circle equation. We talked about the easier version of this earlier. Our full circle equation is x minus h squared plus oops, y minus k squared equals r squared. So we're told the radius, we're told the center, so we can just write out our equation. So it's going to be x minus negative 4 is plus 4 squared plus y minus two squared equals, and then it's gonna be three root five squared. Three root five squared, three squared is nine, times root five squared is just five, so we get a value on the right side of 45. So we're looking for x plus four squared, y minus two squared equals 45, so our answer here is going to be C. Now, we've seen a couple C's or H's in a row, which brings up a good point for test day. Don't worry about patterns. Sometimes it is the same bubble spot like four or five times in a row, so just do the best you can on every single question. All right, at Frankie's Surf Shop, the price of a t-shirt is $20, price of hat $17. James spent $282 on 15 items, and he only purchased t-shirts and hat. How many hats did he buy? Now, this is a system of equations question, a little bit of a word problem. We have to turn to equations. Now, 
let's call t-shirts t and hats h now what do we know well we have two totals here total items so i know that the t-shirts plus the hats have to add to 15 and total price well it's 20 dollars for each t-shirt 17 dollars for each hat that adds to 282 dollars okay from here we're solving for hats so i want to get rid of the t-shirts i'm going to multiply the whole thing by negative 20. so i get negative 20 t minus 20 h equals if i do 15 times negative 20 negative 300. i did this because my t's cancel and i want to solve for h i get negative 3 h equals negative 18. i can divide both these by 3. i get h equals negative 6. answer is g all right 17 we have scientific notation so scientific notation um what we need to do is we have termites in a nest he has been studying so we want to turn this time notation now scientific notation has to be between 0 and 10 so this is 45 so in order to turn this scientific notation i have to move the decimal one point to the left so it has to be 4.569 times 10 to whatever this m value is now if i moved it one to the left what we're doing is we're adding 10 because to go from 4.569 to 45.69 I have to multiply by 10. So 10 is the same as 10 to the first power. So we have to add one to multiply by 10. So the answer here is going to be B. Another easy way to solve this question, like you can plug in a value for M. Let's say M equals one or two. You can use that as a way to help solve as well. If that was hard. All right, percents. We know X is 30% of Y. So we can write that as X equals 0.3 Y. Y is 110%, which is the same as 1.1 times Z x is what percent of z well the trick here is we have y equals 1.1 z so i can plug that in here for x so x equals 0 0.3 times we're plugging in 1.1 z for y so we can do 1.1 times 0.3 which gives me x equals 0 0.33 z 0 0.33 is the same as 33 percent Okay, 39. Of the audience members at a piano recital, fourth, seventh drove a car to the venue. Of the remaining audience members, two fifths took a bus to the piano recital, three tenths took a bike or rode a bicycle. What fraction rode a bicycle to the piano recital? So we know four sevenths drove a car, and it says of the remaining audience members. So if four sevenths drove a car, it means three sevenths were the remaining. And then of those three sevenths, three tenths rode a bicycle. So to find how many total rode a bicycle, we have to multiply these. So we get 9 over 70, the answer of E. All right, 40. A man who drives around a circular track with a radius of 3.9 miles seven times, what's the distance? All right, so we need to find the circumference. Circumference, remember, is 2 pi r. So 2 pi times 3.9. So we can use your calculator. You can do 2 pi times 3.9, which gives us a value of 24.5. We then need to multiply this by 7, because we're driving around it 7 times. Multiply by 7, we get a value of 171.5. Answer is J. 41. Uh, more geometry here. Kitchen floor that is 13 and a third feet wide by 16 feet long is to be covered by square tiles. If each tile is 16 inches by 16 inches, how many tiles are going to be needed to cover the floor? Well, importantly with these questions, we want to turn them all to the same units. So I'm going to turn these all to inches. So 13 and a third feet. What we do is we do 13 and 1 third feet. To convert, we do 12 inches in one foot. So I can do 13 and a third times 12, which gives me a value of 160 inches. For 16 feet, I can do the same thing. I can do 16 feet times 12 to turn it into inches, which gives me a value of 192 inches. Now, if I kind of sketch our kitchen floor out, and always good to give a visual if these are questions that you can't just immediately know how to do. So it's gonna be 160 inches wide, 192 inches long. And we basically have these little tiles we're setting up. Easy way to do this is area. So I can find the entire area, which is gonna be 192 times 160, which is going to be 30,720 square inches. Now, each tile is 16 by 16. So the area of each tile is 16 times 16 or 16 square, which is 256. To find out how many tiles we need, we divide. So I'm gonna do my 30,720 
divided by 256, which tells me I need 120 square tiles. So the answer here is going to be E. All right, 42, we have exponents, rules. So here we just need to simplify this. So let's first distribute our three in the first one and make sure you also distribute it to the number. So four cubed is going to be 64. It's gonna be A to the negative nine, B to the six, because we multiply over 16 A, B to the negative four. Now, here's a good trick I like to use. If we have negative numbers, we can switch them to the bottom or to the top and turn them to be positive. So it can be 64, B to the sixth, and then B to the fourth, because we had B to the negative fourth on the bottom, we move it up. On the bottom, it's 16A times A to the ninth, because we moved that negative nine to the bottom. Now, if we simplify our numbers, 64 divided by 16 is four on top. We add the exponents, we multiply. So B to the 10th over A to the 10th, it's like A to the first times A to the ninth, we add them. So here we get our correct answer of J. All right, uh, number four, ratio of, sorry, number 43, try it again. Ratio of four sides of quadrilateral, quadrilateral are one to four to six to seven. The perimeter is 234, what's the length along the side? Now, I'd say there's a little X trick on these. So we can think of the lengths here as like one X to four X to six X to seven X. I don't know the actual side lengths, but if they're in a proportion of one to four to six to seven, we have to multiply all those values by the same number. Now we know the perimeter is 234, so I can say that my 1x plus my 4x plus my 6x plus my 7x adds to 234. If we combine those, 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 7x gives me 18x equals 234. I can solve by x by dividing by 234 divided by 18, which gives me a value of 13. Now, it asks for the longest side, the longest side was our 7x. So to find the longest side, we do 7 times our x value of 13, which gives us a value of 91 and an answer of A. So that x trick is really helpful if you ever have a ratio and a total like we have here. All right, 44, <clears throat> a little bit of statistics. Um, this is a topic that a lot of students uh, struggle with because it's one that is not taught as much in school. So, uh, but is it, this is one that's in the book that I have. It's a really important one to learn, again, if you're shooting for those really high scores. So here, 400 people are asked to randomly select a number from one to 30. After analyzing the survey responses, it was found that people in the survey are more likely to select a number less than 10 than they were to select a number greater than or equal to 10. Which of the following descriptors best characterize the distribution of the numbers from all the people that participate in the survey? And we have uniform, normal, bimodal, skewed left, skewed right. Now, I'll kind of draw these out. So I'll start with uniform. So a uniform distribution might be, let's say if we're just gonna like roll the dice, let's say we have our different values, it might be just a straight line across. A normal distribution, if you've ever done like a bell curve in math class or in science, this is a normal distribution where it's like evenly uh, kind of distributed, maybe something like height is normally distributed. So uh, I guess not really evenly, it's more there's like a center point, like a lot of people are like average height, some are taller, some are shorter. Bimodal basically means you have what are called two modes. So it's when you have like almost like two peaks. So like this would be bimodal. Maybe if you were graphing, um, say how many people are at a restaurant during the uh, times of day, it might be there's a lot of people at lunch, and a lot of people at dinner, but there are fewer people in between. Uh, skewed left is going to be when we have the tail to the left and more of the data to the right. So this is gonna be our skewed left. The skew is where the tail is. Skewed right is going to basically be higher on the left and the tail is going to be on the right. So that's our skewed right. So here, and again, if we're graphing this, we have numbers one through 30 and it says people are more likely to select numbers less than 10. So if we graph this, people are more likely to select numbers, let's say this is where 10 is, they're more likely to select numbers less than 10 than they are greater than 10. So if this is our 30 and this is our zero, what we're gonna see is a skewed right. So the answer here is K. All right, 45, we're trying to find the area of this in terms of X. So what we need to do is figure out what the length of this side is. Now, this is a 45, 45, 90 right triangle, which means it's going to be an isosceles right triangle, which means this entire length is x from top to bottom. So that means that my length here, from just the top to bottom there, since this is two, is equal to x minus two. Now from here, area is length times width. 
So area is 2x plus 3 times x minus 2. We just have to FOIL this out. So we get 2x squared minus 4x plus 3x minus 6. If we simplify that, I get 2x squared minus x minus 6. Answer is D. All right, 46. Length of rectangle increased by 20%. Width is decreased by 45%. The new area is what percent of the original? Okay. So this is a good example of a question that seems really tricky to solve. And I use something here that I call substitution. So let's just pick some values to make this question easier. Now, since we're doing percents, let's make both sides of our rectangle 10. Why not? You can pick whatever numbers you want. It'll work. Now, our original rectangle has an area of 100. What about our new rectangle? Well, it says the length is increased by 20%. So the new length is going to be 12. We would multiply 10. What you do is multiply by 1.2 to increase by 20%. If we're going to decrease by 45%, it's going to be 6, sorry, not 6, 5.5, because we're multiplying by 0.55. So now what I can do is I can find the new area. So I can do 12 times 5.5. The area is 66. So what percent is it of our original? Well, it's 66% answer is J. Our math way of doing this, our original area is length times width. Our new area, increasing by 20% is 1.2 length. Decreasing by 45 is 0.55 W, which means I get 0 0.66 length times width. And this tells me it's 66%. So definitely a tricky question, but if we plug in numbers, it makes it much easier. All right, which of the following numbers is the solution to the equation? 5x squared plus x plus 2. We see these answer choices, which immediately tell me we're going to be using the quadratic formula. So remember, our quadratic, you have to have this memorized, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So I just got to plug in our values. So here, it's going to be negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 minus 4 times 5 times 2 all over 2 times 5. So I get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 minus 4 times 5 is 20 times 2 is 40 minus 40 over 10. So here I get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of negative 39 over 10. Negative 39. Uh, you can't do the square root of a negative number, so we have to take out an i. So we get negative 1 plus or minus i root 39 over 10. So here we can see one of our answers, B, matches with that. Important not to use the quadratic formula, so have this memorized. Also important to understand how uh, complex numbers work. All right, 48. We are given this weird looking hotel. We're told it's 120 feet long, 72 feet wide, has a surface area of 7,950. Depth is four feet. What is the total volume in square feet of the uh, pool here? So if we're going through and just trying to find the volume of this, what we need to do is we have to use basically our volume is equal to basically base times height equation. Now the B here represents the area of the base. So it's basically like we find whatever the area is and multiply it by the height. So here the area of this whole base we're told is 7950. So the volume is 7950 and then the height is 4 feet. So that is what we're going to do. So 7950 times 4 gives us the volume, which is 31,800. All right, 49, which one is equivalent? So to do this, we have to understand how to make a common denominator. What we have to do, we have to multiply the first one by x minus 2 on top and on bottom. Multiply the second one by 3x on top and on bottom. So this is going to give us a common denominator. So if I simplify this, I get 7x minus 14 over... 3x squared minus 6x plus 4 times 3x is 12x over the same thing 3x squared minus 6x. So now that the denominators are the same, I can combine my like terms here. So if I have 7x plus 12x, I get 19x minus 14 over 3x squared minus 6x. So my answer here is going to be B. All right, number 50, we have a matrix question. Now, this is a, definitely a more advanced matrix question, has to do with multiplication. Uh, again, remember, I have the free trial to my ultimate ACT course where you can learn exactly how to do everything with matrices. So there's a link in the description down below where you can learn how to solve um, 
questions like this. This is a really hard question, more advanced, as we will see um, towards the back of the test. So here we're given two classes of first graders on a field trip to the Baltimore Aquarium. The first class has six chaperones and 34 students. The second uh, school has eight chaperones and 42 students. So if adult tickets are 60, student tickets are 18, which one represents the cost in sales for each of the classes? So here, we have to kind of figure out what's going on. Now, major multiplication, I'm not gonna teach all of it right now, like I said, it's in the free trial, but basics here we can start with are the dimensions. So we have to make sure the dimensions work. Our top ones are a one by two and a two by two. So we check our middle values here and it works. We'll get a one by two matrix. Um, in the bottom, we have a two by one and then a two by two, which is going to give us an impossible matrix because the middle numbers don't work. So we can already tell that J and K are going to be correct. Now, what we need here is we need to make sure that the numbers line up properly. Matrix multiplication is a combination of working across and down. And again, if this seems confusing, if you haven't learned matrix multiplication, it's gonna seem a little confusing until you go learn exactly how all this stuff works. But we wanna make sure if we're going through, our first class has six adults and 34 students. So the six adults are each 60. So I wanna see six adults times 60, and then the 34 children are each $18. So I wanna see that to find the total for say my first class. So if I'm going across and down, I need to see, again, our 60 here represents the adults, the 18 is gonna be the students. So correct answer ends up being H because when I'm doing multiplication, if I work across and down, it'd be 60 times six, which is our price for our adults, and then 18 times 34, which is the price for the students. For the second class, when we go down our second row here, it'll be oops, 60 times eight for the adults and then 18 times 42 for the students. So again, that's how we get to H. Like I said, I know that explanation is not going to make you feel satisfied if you've never learned matrix multiplication. This is a more advanced example. You have to learn the basics how matrix multiplication works. This is about as hard as they can make matrices on the test because it's a conceptual question, not one you can just solve with numbers. All right, uh, 52, uh, they love law of sines, law of cosines on the test. Make sure you know both of these. This is a law of sines question. This is a more advanced trig. So law of sines is if I have a triangle, I'll actually draw the triangle first. So if I have a triangle that looks like, and again, this is one that if you've never learned this before, it's gonna be a little bit confusing. So if this is my side length A, side length B, side length C, the rule, is that the sine of angle A over side length A is equal to the sine of angle B over B, which is equal to the sine of angle C over C. It's basically just this rule for any triangle. Now, I'm asked here to find out how many fence posts I need if we're gonna put one every 20 feet. So I need to find what these side lengths are. And with law of sines, we're always gonna be looking for pairs of angles and side lengths across to use. So. I'm gonna go ahead and start with solving for, let's say this angle X right here, okay? So I can use these two pairs. So I can say that the sine of 42 over X equals the sine of 840 over, sorry, try it again, sine of 55 over 840. So to solve for X, we're gonna cross multiply. So I get 840 sine 42 equals x sine 55. To solve for x, I divide both sides by the sine of 55, which gives me, I'll put it up here, x is equal to 840 sine 42 divided by the sine of 55. Okay, so we've solved for x. Now, I need to solve for y. So I'm gonna erase this, give myself some room. So to solve for y, we have to find this angle. So that angle is 180 minus 42 minus 55. So it's gonna be 83 degrees. So now we can use two pairs. So I'm gonna use my same 840, 55, and my Y and my uh, 83. So I can say that the sine of 83 over Y equals the sine of 55 over 840. We can cross multiply and solve 840 sine 83 equals y times the sine of 55. Again, divide by sine 55 to get our y, okay? So we find out, we know what y and x equal. So now to find the perimeter, 
I need to add them up. So I have to have 840 plus this, plus this, and then I have to divide it all by 20. Because once I find the perimeter, I'm asked to find how many fence posts, and we put one every 20 feet. So looking at the inch choices, we have to have one that's divided by 20, and we have to have our 840 plus our 840 sine 42 over 55, plus our 840 sine 83 over 55, so correct answer here is going to be C. Again, definitely a tricky question. Make sure if you haven't learned law of sines, law of cosines, it's one you add to your list to learn. A really important one to understand. Okay. Uh, 52 here, we have complex numbers. So to solve for complex numbers, uh, these are ones that are on the test. One good thing to know is if you guys have a fancier calculator I have here, there's actually an I button at the bottom right above. I'll show you where the decimal point is. So you probably can't see it, but there's an I button right above that. So in a question like this, we can actually, if you have this calculator, once we solve for x, plug it in. So I can subtract one from both sides, which gives me x times one plus three i equals two. And then I get x equals two divided by one plus three i. Now again, if you have a fancier calculator here, you can literally type this into your calculator and then you can hit math and hit the frac button and it will literally tell you which of these answers is correct, which of course is really useful. So if you have, again, that fancier calculator, if you have an I button, use it, it will do the math for you. Now, if you don't, this is a hard question because you have to know something called the complex conjugate. We can't have I's on the bottom of a fraction, so we have to multiply by the complex conjugate, which is we're gonna switch the middle value. So here, I get two minus six I on top. On the bottom, if I do the complex conjugate, the middle terms cancel out, and I just get here 10 on the bottom. Because if I do one plus three i times one minus three i, I get one times one is one. I get minus three i plus three i, and then I get plus nine i squared. Uh, sorry, minus nine i squared. i squared is negative one, so this whole turns into plus nine, which is how we get 10. If I simplify this, two over 10 is gonna be one fifth, and then it's gonna be minus three fifths i. So here we get an answer of K. All right, uh, 53, this is a weighted average question. So Imani goes on a bicycle ride for 60 minutes. First 20 minutes rides 22 miles per hour. Next 15 rides 28 miles per hour. Final 25 rides 20 miles per hour. What is close to her average pace? Now, weighted average questions, they seem really hard, but they're actually easy. We can solve this in one simple equation. Uh, again, averages is in the free trial to my ultimate ACT math course, the whole chapter from my book, as well as videos of me teaching you how to do questions like this and other really difficult questions. Uh, and the whole, again, like I said, the whole chapter of, of um, me teaching and also all the practice questions. So how do we do this? Well, use weighted average. What we're gonna do is basically take the time, 20 minutes and the speed. Time, 15 minutes, pace, 28. Time, 25 minutes, pace, 20. And we're going to divide that by the entire amount of time, 60 minutes, and that'll get us straight to the answer. So we do 20 times 22 plus 15 times 28 plus 25 times 20, and we get a value of 1360. You divide that by 60, and we get a value of 22.66, repeating, which rounds to 22.7. So our correct answer here is going to be C. Okay, 54 has to do with probability here. So we're given all this table and information and we're said, two customers are picked from the sample at random and then given that no customer is chosen twice, what's well, probably both customers from the same age bracket. Now, in order for this to happen, we have three outcomes that would count. So we can have the probability that we pick two people who are 16 to 29, plus the probability we pick two people who are 30 to 49, plus the probability we pick people two people who are 50 to 75. Now. Let's start with 16 to 29 here. So what's the probability I pick two people? Well, the first person I pick, it's 105 out of the total is 290. Now the second person, I've already picked one, there's only 104 people left out of 289. We can repeat that for 30 through 49, there's 165 total people out of 290. Once I pick one, there's one fewer person from each category. So it's 164 over 89 with our final one, there's 20 people out of the 290, and then multiply that by 19 over the 289. So putting all that together, we add those, which is our value of K here is our answer. Okay, 54, we got a rate question. So 
1.2 seconds for an uh, object to travel 200.4 feet to the nearest mile per hour what's the speed so we can do distance over time so we can do 200.4 feet over 1.2 seconds now I got to convert to miles per hour so I can first com convert seconds to minute we know there's 60 seconds in one minute I can then convert minutes to hours there's 60 minutes in one hour so our seconds cancel, our minutes cancel. I need to convert feet to miles. So I know there's one mile for 5,280 feet. So the feet cancel. So we're left with our miles per hour. So our units all work out. So we just need to do the math now. So I can do 200.4 times 60 times 60, divide that by 5,280, and we'll get a value of 136.64, answer is C. All right, 56, we have to know how an ellipse works. If you've never seen ellipses before, this explanation might be a little bit confusing, but I'll go over the basics, which is our ellipse equation is x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. Here, the center is at hk. The a value we can think of, I like to think of this as like the x radius. It's how far left or right we go. b value is like the y radius. So you have to have... This equation memorized for testing in case you see ellipses towards the back. If they do appear, they'll ask one of those last 10 or 15 questions. So we can kind of sketch this out to find out what it looks like, where the major axis is. So the center here is at positive 3, negative 4, since it's x minus 3, y plus 4. So we see our center is here at 3, negative 4. The 9 tells me that a value is 3, because it's like our a squared which means our ellipse goes three left and three right. And then the B value down here is five, because it's 25. So it means it's gonna go up five units and down five units. So this is roughly what, not a very good drawing here, but this is just roughly what the ellipse will look like. The major axis, which is what it's asking for, is the long axis. So here, it's gonna be the endpoints at the top or at the bottom. The one at the top is up five units, it's at three, one. One at the bottom is down five units at three, negative nine. So our answer here is going to be H. 57, 16 tennis players show at a doubles tournament. What's the maximum number of two player teams? So basically what's the maximum number of ways I can pick two people out of 16? This is a combination. It doesn't matter which order I pick people in, they're on the same team. So this is 16 C2. Your calculator has this. You might see a little NCR button for combination. If you're using a T84 fancy one like me, what you can do is you can click on the math button and scroll over to PRB or PROB, and you'll see an NCR. So we can do R16, and then you can do C, uh, R is how many you're picking, which is two, and we get a value of 120. So make sure you understand how to do permutations and combinations for the test. As well, 58, we have a uh, roots question to find which one is equivalent. So two ways to solve this. First, I'll solve this algebraically, which involves splitting up the root. So we can split this into root 4x over root y minus root y over root x. To combine these, I need to make a common denominator. So I can multiply by each other. So I can do root x by root x on the first one, root y by root y on the second one, which means that I can now simplify these. So the left one, I get root 4x squared, because I can multiply the x and the 4x, and then I get root xy, and then on the other one, I have root y squared, and again, root xy. I made the denominators the same, so we can combine these on top, root 4x squared minus root y squared over root xy. I can now simplify these. Root 4x squared becomes 2x, root y squared is just raw y, and then I just have root xy, which means my answer here is going to be j. Now, our second way to solve this equivalent question is we can also plug in values. So let's say I pick x equals 1 and y equals 2 as my numbers. I can plug those numbers into my original equation, see what I get, and see which answer gives me the same value. So I plug those in. Here I get root 4 over 2 minus root 2 over 1, which gives me root 2 minus root 2, which equals 0. So all I need to do is take these answers, plug them in and see which one gives me zero. So four, of course, is not zero. In G, if I plug these in, I get four times root x, y is four root two. That's not zero on top. In H, I get four minus two, which is two. In J, I'll get two times one minus two, 
over the square root of 2, which is 0 over root 2, which of course is 0. K will also not work. All right, final stretch, 59. We have a Pascal's triangle question. So we have to know how to expand binomials with the Pascal's triangle. If you've never done this before, this is going to be confusing. So we here have to know how to do this. This is going to be our x to the fourth level, x cubed, x squared. So as we're going through, these are our coefficients. So the way this works is it's going to be 1 times our first term, 3x to the fourth power. Then it's 4 times our first term, 3x cubed. And then 2 to the first power, 6 times 3x squared and 2 squared. 4 times 3x and 2 to the third power, and then 2, basically 1, times 2 to the fourth power. You can see the first terms here, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, basically count down. The second term counts up. There's not in the first one, but it's 2 to the first, 2 to the second, 2 cubed, 2 to the fourth. Now, again, if this is totally new or very, very confusing, I teach this way more thoroughly in my Ultimate ACT Math course, which teaches off my whole book um, as well. So this, again, a lot of these topics I'm not going to go through in entire depth in this video, so I'm just going to how to solve the question. Now, with this one, we're asked for the x cubed term, which is this term here. If you really know how to do this, you can just shortcut and get right to this term. So all I need to do here is do simplify the term. So it's going to be 4 times 3x cubed is 27x cubed. We cube the 3 times 2, so we just do 4 times 27 times 2, which gives me a coefficient of 216. All right, last one, number 60. This is a logarithm question. They've loved these on recent tests, so definitely good to make sure we know some log rules. There are two that are going to apply to this question. So if I have log base, let's say a of x to the b power, we bring the b to the front, so this is the same as b log base a of x, or if I have log base a of let's say x times y, we can do log base a of x plus log base a of y. Okay, so now how do we apply it to this question? So I have log base a of x equals b, log base a of c, or a of y equals c, and I have this whole thing here. Now, first trick is we can turn this, a square root is the same as the one half power. So I can apply our first rule up here and bring the 1 half to the front. So I can write this as 1 half log base a of x squared y to the sixth. Now I can use my second rule and I can split this. So since these are multiplied, it's 1 half times, I can split it to make it log base a of x squared plus log base a of y to the sixth. Now I can use my first rule again to bring these to the front. So it becomes 1 half, and then in the parentheses it's 2, log base a of x plus 6, log base a of y. Now I can distribute the 1 half to simplify this. So if I distribute the 1 half, 1 half times 2 is just 1, so it's just log base a of x. 1 half times 6 is 3, log base a of y. Now we know log base a of x is equal to b, so I can replace this with, I'll move this over here so it's easier to see. So I can replace this with b, log base a of y is equal to c, so I can replace this with c, so we get our answer here is b plus 3c, so the correct answer is h. So again, hard question, you can see a lot of the stuff at the back of the test, the last 15 are where we really picked up the difficulty and expect that to happen on testing. Now, of course, if this math section seems intimidating or ACT math in general seems intimidating, do not worry, I've got some resources that can help you prepare. Uh, number one, I would recommend ordering a copy of that ACT math book. Uh, what you're gonna see on the screen now is a diagnostic sheet for this test. So what you can do is if you took this practice test or were going through the video and saw certain questions you struggled on, the diagnostic sheet will tell you the topics each question is and exactly which chapter in the math book it uh, is covered by. Now with the ACT math book, if you get it, I have a video course where I teach you this entire math book. Not only is my math book the most up-to-date one on the market, a lot of other good ACT math books or popular ones are actually old. They're written in like 2016 or 2017 or 2018 and they're not current to the current version of the test. So they're actually missing a lot of the topics we saw that are on the ACT in 2023 and 2024 that we saw on this practice test here. Um, also with that book, I have a video course of me teaching the entire book. It has over 35 hours of videos of me teaching everything in the book, solving over 1,250 practice questions. 
Uh, and there's also, it's only $29.99 a month to get that uh, one if you get the book. There's also a lower price option of $12.99 a month. So nice, cheap options. Additionally, if you're studying for the entire ACT, you can sign up for the free trial and ultimate ACT course. That one's just $99 a month, and it has courses for English, reading, math, science. It's got practice test explanations, so it has everything you can need to work with an expert tutor like me at a much lower price. Now, of course, if you guys have any other questions related to math or anything else ACT related, please let me know in the comments down below. I always take time to respond to those. Uh, of course, please like and subscribe. There are lots more ACT content we're coming out with every week or two. I'll have videos uh, for you guys to watch. Other than that, I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope this helps you guys get some fantastic math scores. This is Matt at Prep Pro signing off. I will see you guys next time.